Hi everyone, let's start with our new topic which is on welfare economics and environment. So under topic 3, it can be divided into 3 parts. But for the sake of your class, we will only focus on part 1 which is on efficiency and optimality and part 3 which is on market failure. Okay? Let's start with our first part which is on efficiency and optimality. Let's assume that there is no externalities in the markets and goods are all private. Okay, economy consists of two persons. You have person A and person B. And then we are also dealing with two goods, which is good X and good Y. Okay, productions of goods uses two input, which is labor and capital. If you look at here, the productions of good X is actually coming from capital and labor. And the good Y can also be produced using capital and labor. Okay, now individual utility depends on two goods consumed. If you look at here, utility of person A is actually a function of or depends on the consumptions of good X and good Y. Similarly, with the utility of person B, it depends on the consumptions of good X and good Y. Okay, now. The marginal utility of person A derived from consumptions of good X is denoted as below. So you can see here the utility of person A from the consumptions of good X equals to the partial derivatives of utility divided with the partial derivative of the good X. So similarly with the other three as well. Okay. Marginal products of labor in the productions of good Y is denoted as MPLs of good Y equals to partial derivatives of good Y divided with partial derivatives of labor in the productions of good Y. And similarly with the other three, marginal rates of utility substitution for a person A is actually the rate at which good X can be substituted for Y at the margin and vice versa while holding a person's A's utility constant and this can be represented by indifference curve. Marginal rates of technical substitution between capital and labor in the productions of good X is the rate at which capital can be substituted for labor at the margin and vice versa while holding the outputs of X constants and this can be represented by isoquant. Marginal rates of transformation for good X and Y is the rate at which the output can be transformed into the other by marginally shifting capitals or labor from one line of the production to the other. For instance, we are talking about marginal rates of transformation for labor is actually increased in the outputs of Y obtained by shifting a small amounts of labor from the use in the X production to the use in Y productions or vice versa. Okay? Allocations of resources is actually efficient if it is not possible to make one person better off without making others worse off. And this condition is called as Pareto optimality. And the allocations of resources is considered as inefficient if it is possible to improve someone else's position without worsening the others and we call this condition as Pareto improvement. There are actually three conditions to achieve efficient allocation. The first condition is that we have to achieve efficiency in consumption and the condition is that our marginal rates of utility substitution for person A should equal to the marginal rates of utility substitution for person B. Okay, it is actually possible to allocate the fixed amounts of X and Y between person A and B. So if you look at this diagram, so let's start with point A0. So at this point, person A will get nothing. So person A will not get X and Y, while person B will get everything. The same thing as at point B0, person B will not get anything, while person A will get everything. So let's look at, at this point point A0. So when person A move to the left, basically person A will get more X. And if person A move downward, it will get more of Y. The same thing for person B. If let's say person B move to the right, it will get more X. If person B move, to, move upward, it will get more of Y. Okay, now 
if you want to reallocate from point A to point B, so what happened to the resources? Okay, let's look at from the points of view of person A. So person A has to make these steps. So from A, it has to move to point B. So definitely person A has to let go of X to get more of Y. So what happened to person B? So person B will make this kind of step. So it will sacrifice Y to get more of X. Okay, so when you move from point A to point B, Basically, person B will have a higher utility. Why is that? So if you look at this indifference curve for person B, so this is indifference curve 1 and this is indifference curve 2. So at point A, basically person B is in indifference curve 1. But at the point B, basically person B is in the second or higher indifference curve. So basically person B has a higher utility. Okay, what happened to person A? So if you look at this indifference curve for person A, at point A and point B, basically it is the same indifference curve. So person A has a constant utility. Second condition to achieve efficient allocation is efficiency in production. So basically, the condition is that the marginal rates of technical substitutions of good X should equal to the marginal rates of technical substitutions of good Y. So this diagram is very similar to the previous diagram. However, in this case, we are talking about the productions of good X and good Y using capital and labor. So basically, if you move to the left side, you are producing X using more labor. If you move downwards, you are producing X using more capitals. So if let's say you want to move from point A to point B, what happens is that you have to reduce labor and you will produce X using more capital. Okay, so the third condition to achieve efficient allocation is using production mix efficiency. So how to fulfill this condition? Basically, the marginal rates of technical substitutions of good X and good Y should equal to the marginal rates of utility substitution for person A and person B. So in this case, you will have to draw your production possibility functions or marginal rates of transformation. Okay, so basically, your PPF or PPC, production possibility curve, should be tangent with your indifference curve. Okay, in that case, you will achieve production efficiency, okay, which is at point B. So it says that moving from point A to point B or from point C to point B will give you a higher indifference curve or higher utility. So why is that? Because at point B, so this is your indifference curve. If let's say you are looking at point A, your indifference curve should be somewhere here. So Remember, for indifference curve, the higher the indifference curve, the higher the utility that you will get. While for point C, you can see that the indifference curve should be somewhere here. So at point B, the indifference curve is higher. So your utility is higher. Okay? Given productions and utility function, there will be many efficient allocation of resources. So in this case, we are saying that the efficient allocation point is not unique. So what is unique? Unique here means there is only one point. So because of this, we need social welfare function to rank the alternative allocation. Okay, this is the social welfare function for two person. So the utility of a person A should equal to the utility of a person B. So let's assume that the welfare is non-decreasing in utility of a person A and utility of a person B where utility of a person A cannot decrease if utility of a person B were to rise. So the partial derivative of the welfare function for both persons should be positive, as well as all three conditions for efficiency should be whole. The slope of social indifference curve and utility possibility frontier should equal to each other. So this is the slope for indifference curve and these two equation is the slope for utility possibility frontier. Okay, if you look at this diagram, basically point A and C has a lower social welfare indifference curve. 
And point B is actually the maximum social welfare function for both persons, which is A and B. Okay. Okay, let's have some discussion where resources move from the inefficient point to efficient allocation point. Does it represent a welfare improvement? So we will discuss about this question during the class time or the live session. Okay. The answer to the previous question is not necessarily because the movement might result in lower level of social improvement. If you look at this diagram, this is the utility of person B and this is the utility of person A. Okay, you can also see that we have two indifference curve. This is the first one and this is the second one. So for the indifference curve, the higher it is from the origin. So the higher the utility is. Okay, now we also have this PPC. What is PPC? Production Possibility Curve, or we can also call it PPF, Production Possibility Frontier. Okay, at point C, we can say that this is inefficient point or inefficient allocation point. While at point D, it is an efficient point. But if you look at point C and D, point C will give you a higher level of social welfare than point D because point C at the higher indifference curve. Okay, let's look at this point A. It is allocative efficient point and it is on the higher social welfare indifference curve. If you want to move from point C to point E, you will achieve Pareto improvement for both person A and B because they are in the higher welfare function. Okay, if you want to move from point C to point D, what happens is that efficient allocation if for the point D, but it is not Pareto improvement because B will definitely gain. If you look at person B, it will get the benefit because it is on the efficient point, but A will suffer because there is a reduction in social welfare for A. Okay? Market failure occurs when the allocations of goods and services by the free markets is not efficient. It is likely to occur if any of the assumptions required for proving that markets are Pareto efficient is not met. So the examples of market failure are like missing markets, public goods, externalities, inadequate property rights, imperfect information, and imperfect competition. So the image on the right side is actually the case of market failure occurs in Chiliwung River, Jakarta. So the river doesn't look like a river, right? So this is the examples of negative externality. Private property right exists whenever an entity is able to exclude, at least partially, others from either using an asset or enjoying the benefits from its use. So there are a few characteristics of private property rights. The first one is appropriability of returns. So it means that how much of the returns we can get from our sales. So basically, we can control the benefits coming from our asset. Next one is ability to divide or transfer. For instance, if let's say we purchase hectares of land, so we can actually divide or transfer our land to our children. The next one is degree of exclusiveness. So some properties are private and no one can do anything with our property. But some properties, even though they are private, but others can also use it. For instance, there, there are farms in UK which are private, but people can walk across the farm. Okay, the next one is duration. So for instance, if we purchase a leasehold house, we may be able to use it, for instance, just for 99 years. Okay, the next one is enforceability. If let's say someone steal our property, so basically we can take that person to court and we can get back our property. Okay, when private properties rights are absent, so our property could be called as open access. So what is this open access? Basically, it means that everyone can do whatever they like to our property. So the exploitation for our property is uncontrollable. For instance, wasting. So when we talk about land, if let's say everyone can just throw their rubbish to the land, so our land will become wasting. The next one is common property. So basically, the property rights are shared and it is able to 
be exploited. And we can say the exploitation is regulated by legals or customary convention. It means that there is one uh, entity who will control this property and everyone can also use it. Okay? Private goods should have these characteristics. The first one is excludability, where the agents can be prevented or excluded from consuming the goods. And second is rivalry, whether one agent's consumption is at the expense of another. So now, can you give me an example to differentiate between these two concepts? Okay, we will discuss this during the class session. Typology of resources. The first type is private goods. So in this case, it is excludable and rival. For instance, car. When you purchase your car, you exclude people from using it. And it is also rival. It means that your car cannot be purchased by anyone else. The second one is open access resources. So in this case, it is non-excludable. For instance, fishing ground. So everyone can catch fish, but it is rival. It means that your consumption is at the expense of other people. So this is what we call tragedy of the commons. Because when you keep using it, when you keep consuming the fish, so at the end, the resources will vanish. And the third one, we call it congestible resources. So in this case, the example is nature park. So these resources is excludable. It means that the nature park may have an entrance fee. So you can exclude people who do not pay for the entrance fee. But it is non-rival. It means that your consumption is not at the expense of other people. The last one, we call it public good. So for public good, it is non-excludable and non-rival. For instance, street light. So you cannot exclude people from consuming it and your consumption is not at the expense of other people. We will call a good as a public good if no one can be excluded from benefiting from it. It is non-rival. For instance, the marginal cost of allowing an additional consumer to use the goods is zero. So the supplies of public goods normally result in positive externalities that are not remunerated. However, public goods will tend to be undersupplied by markets. So why is this condition happen if let's say public good give us positive externalities? Why it tend to be undersupplied by the market? We will discuss this question during the class time, okay? For a two person with two private good economy, the product mix condition for allocative efficiency is given below. So the marginal rates of utility substitution for person A should equal to the marginal rates of utility substitution for person B and will also equal to the marginal rates of transformation. So the economic efficiency will be satisfied in a pure competitive market economy. But for a two person economy where X is actually a public good and Y is a private good. The condition will be given below. The marginal rates of utility substitution for person A plus the marginal rates of utility substitution for person B equals to the marginal rates of transformation. So economic efficiency will not be satisfied. So a pure market economy cannot supply a public good at the level required for allocative efficiency. Who will supply a public good? Private markets will under allocate resources to public good because firms cannot make money out of it. There is no way to make consumers pay a price because it is impossible to exclude them from consuming the goods for free. So people have an incentive to free ride. For instance, they will not contribute anything to the provisions of the public good but get the benefits from others' contribution. When we talk about the provisions of street light, we know that everyone will get the benefits out of it. But we cannot exclude them from enjoying the benefits of street light. This is the graphical examples of provisions of public goods. So imagine we have two consumers, person A and person B, and one public good, which is X. Okay, now this is the demand curve for a person A, and this is the demand curve for a person B. Summations of these two demands will give us the total demand. So for your information, the demand curve represents the marginal willingness to pay for the public goods. 
So now we have to sum the marginal valuation vertically because all consumers can get access to the public goods due to its non-rival and non-excludable characteristics. And you have to sum it vertically like this. And the social efficient point is at 2.5 units. However, no one has the incentive to pay for any units of X at the marginal cost of 15 because the marginal cost is very expensive, right? If let's say we are talking about two consumers or two players, negotiation is possible. However, if you are dealing with many people, it is hard to negotiate because the free riding issues is very tempting. Potential solution to the public goods problem. The first one is that we can use technological fix. For instance, technology can require drivers to pay for road use. So in this case, we can make a non-excludable goods become excludable. Second, the government can supply the public goods. However, how does the government know how much to supply the public goods? So definitely the government can use command and control type decision. In this case, government can command to provide the public goods and can observe whether it is sufficient or not sufficient to the public. And second, the government can also use voting system to determine the provisions of public goods. Or government can use economic approaches to valuation. And the last one, we can use payment for the supply of public goods. Payments for ecosystem services is actually the provisions of environmental goods by private and public sector. For instance, United States Department of Agriculture has a conservation reserve program and then what they did was that they give payment to farmers to vegetate sensitive area. So we also have another example for Costa Rica. They give public payment for conservation, reforestation and forest management. And the last one, you also have another example for Bush Heritage Australia. So their goal is to protect 1% of Australia by 2025 via private purchases. So these are all the examples of payment for ecosystem services. What is externalities? When the decisions of one agent have an impact on another agent in an unintended way and no compensation is made. So externalities only occur when property rights are not well defined or enforced and or, or the transaction costs are large because there are many parties or agents that we have to deal with. So externalities often involve with non-rival and non-excludable goods. So for instance, emission from a factory. So in this case, the emission from a factory can have two characteristics, which is public goods and public bad. So we will discuss how come the emission from a factory can have these two characteristics and we will discuss it during the class time. Since we have learned about externalities, do you think that people in this photo are suffering from the impacts of market failure, which is externalities? So what do you think about it? We will discuss this question during the class time as well. Okay. Types of externalities. Externalities can arise in consumption and affect consumption. So if you look at this function, utility of a person A is not only affected by the consumptions of good X and Y, it can also be affected by the consumptions of person B. In this case, when B is smoking, he can affect the utility of person A. Okay, second, externality can also arise in consumption and affect production. So if you look at here, the productions of X is not only affected using capital and labor, it can also be affected by the consumptions of person A. In this case, when A is listening to loud music, it can affect the productions of X. For instance, the productions of cake will be affected because his neighbor is listening or playing a loud music. Okay, next, the externality can also arise in production and affect consumption. So if you look at here, the consumption or utility of person A is not only affected using the consumptions of good X and Y, it can also be affected because of the productions of good X. So this is the common issues of externalities where pollution from the productions of good X will affect the utility of person A or the health of the person A. So the last one, externality can arise in production and also affect production. So in this case, 
the productions of good X is not only affected by capital and labor, it can also be affected with the productions of Y. So in this case, the flower at the farms for Y actually benefit from the productions of X. For instance, if let's say you have two farms, one farm is for flower, another farm is for bees or honey. So the honey's farm will get the benefits from the flower farm. Okay. Let's illustrate the negative externalities using a diagram. So your y-axis is the price, while the x-axis is the quantity of x produced. Your demand curve should be downward sloping, and the supply curve is upward sloping. And the supply equals to marginal cost. And this marginal cost refers to the private cost. So when your demand and supply curve intersect with each other, so you will have private equilibrium point. Okay, so P1 and X1 is actually the equilibrium point. Suppose when you are producing your products, you are polluting the environment. Okay, or you are creating the externalities. So we call it marginal external cost. So when you want to take into account the marginal external cost, your new equilibrium point will shift to the left side. Okay, so we call it marginal social cost instead of marginal private cost. So this is your new socially efficient point. Okay, so you can see here the shaded area, right? So this shaded area refers to the aggregate social cost of overproduction. So when you are at the private equilibrium, you are overproducing the products because supposedly when you want to take into account the pollution created by you, you have to produce at X2. But at the private equilibrium, you are producing at x1 so you are over producing the products okay so when you want to tackle or you when you want to take into account the pollution you should charge at p2 but you are charging at p1 at the private equilibrium so we are saying that the private equilibrium involves an overproduction of x and too many external costs so let's look at it from the positive externality point of view. So when your demand curve intercepts with the supply curve, you will have the private equilibrium. Here, your demand curve equals to the marginal private benefit. Okay, so suppose when you are producing the X, you are actually creating the marginal external benefit. So definitely, you will have a new equilibrium point. So this new equilibrium point is actually refers to your marginal social benefit instead of marginal private benefit. So if you look at this shaded area, it refers to the aggregate social cost of underproduction. So suppose you should produce at X2. This is the socially efficient point. But previously at the private equilibrium, you are producing lesser, which is X1. Okay, so we can say that the private equilibrium involve an underproduction of X. Okay, when you are talking about positive externality goods and too few external benefits. Okay. Externalities and allocative inefficiency. Private agents normally will equate their marginal cost and marginal benefit. So you will have MC equals to MB without taking into account the impacts on others. So normally, they will not take into account the negative externalities or positive externalities. Once the external impacts are included, definitely socially efficient point may diverge from the private equilibrium. So externalities typically lead to inefficient allocations of resources because the market prices do not accurately reflect the additional costs or additional benefit to the third party. So in other words, they don't reflect all costs of production. So this may lead to a misallocation of resources because the price is not equal to the marginal social cost because in the private equilibrium, the price is only equals to marginal cost, which is refers to the marginal private benefit. But if let's say we are taking into account the externalities of all the pollution produced, so we have to make sure that the price should equal to the marginal social cost. So in this case, we need the intervention from the government to correct 
the market. Okay. Examples of externality rise from consumption, which can also affect consumption. So this is the marginal benefits of pollution to person A or to a company. So definitely when a company produces goods, the company will get profit out of pollution. Okay, so this pollution affect person B and person B will get the marginal external cost out of this pollution. If let's say there is no government rules, no bargaining process or compensation, person A or company wants to pollute up to point P0. So at this point P0, definitely the company will enjoy the total benefits or maximum benefits out of this pollution. So the area of this total benefits is point A, B and D. Okay, while for person B, definitely he wants the pollution to be zero. So zero is here. So at this point, which is pollution equals to zero, the total cost is point B, point D, and point C. So if you look at the pollution at zero, is it an efficient point? So definitely it is not because the marginal benefit here is actually larger than the marginal external cost. How about when the point or the pollution is at P0? So at, at P0, the marginal external cost is larger than the marginal benefit. So it is also not an efficient point. So the efficient point should be marginal benefit equals to marginal external cost, which is at this point. So you can see here it is at P star. My question now is how to achieve efficiency or efficient point. So we will discuss the answer during the class time. So you can also think about other example. For instance here, A is a musician while B hates music. So in this case, the pollution is not just the pollution produced by a factory or by a company. The pollution can be also in this case, noise pollution. Okay, because B hates music. So if you look at here, the utility of a person A depends on M here is the wealth of a person A because when you have wealth or money, you can purchase anything and purchasing good will give you higher utility and utility of person A is affected by their wealth as well as the music played by person A while utility for person B because here the noise pollution is considered as externality or negative externality to point B to person B so person B will get the utility from its wealth as well as the music played by person A so if you have this kind of problem or issues between your neighbor so how to solve this problem so we will also discuss this during the class time okay if you face the previous problem you can apply causian solution by assigning property rights to one of the parties so let's say you have option one b has the property right to a clean environment so in this case person b and person a will keep bargaining until p star is achieved because p star is the efficient point because the property rights belong to person b so a would be willing to pay okay to person b this area area a and area b so that person a can pollute up to p star so what is the potential gain from this trade so if you look at this curve for person b it is here right so the gain from this trade for B is this area. Okay, so now if let's say we opt for second option. Second option, A has the property right to pollute. Okay, now they will keep bargaining so that the pollution can be reduced. Because when you give the property right to the firm, to person A, so person A will like to pollute up to P0, right? Because at P0, person A will get the maximum benefit out of this pollution. So, person B has to bargain. So, person B will be willing to pay at point C and point D, right? To reduce the pollution. So, what is the potential gain from this trade to person A? Because A has the right to pollute. So, person A will get this area. 
find the okay so you solve the problem Coase theorem which is introduced by Ronald Coase says that proper assignments of property right even if externalities are present will allow bargaining between parties such that efficient solution can be arrived or achieved regardless of who holds the right so with the assumption that you have costless transaction costs and damages are accessible and measurable okay now my question is why aren't Gaussian solution always pursued if you think that you have externalities and cost theorem can solve it so why don't we pursue or apply it to solve the problem so we will discuss this during the class time as well okay the problem with the Gaussian solutions are the first one transaction costs are often large for instance externality sometimes is caused by manufacturers or company or sometimes it can also affect many people so how can you want to set up a negotiation or ask for bargaining or compensation if let's say you are dealing with many players right and sometimes the monitorings or informations are very expensive if let's say you are affected by pollution but you don't know who pollute your environment and you don't know how much pollution are you getting it from the factory so all these informations are unknown to you because they are very expensive so you cannot do the bargaining process and sometimes other solutions are also possible for instance Pigovian tax so this Pigovian tax does not require bargaining between the parties so you will have lower transaction costs that's why Pigovian tax or other solutions are more preferable compared to Gaussian solution second reason property rights often costly to define and to enforce so in this case if you look at this image so basically the cells of the fishermen are affected by the pollution made by the villagers but how can you define that this ocean belong to villagers or belong to the fishermen so because you cannot define the property right that's why it is hard for you to bargain or to do the enforcement okay the third reason why Gaussian solutions are not preferable because externalities often have properties of public goods and public bets. So for your information, private solutions don't work well due to the large incentive to pre-write. So Gaussian solutions are actually more suitable to the externalities which are private in nature. So the next one, source of pollution sometimes is very unclear and you don't know who are polluting your area because you are dealing with many factories around your house and the victims are unaware of the pollution impacts even though you get the emissions of air pollution but you don't know how severe the problem caused to your health and the last one strategic behavior and market power for instance even though you are actually living in the area of pollution and you know that a factory is actually polluting your environment but you don't have any choice because that factory is producing smartphone and you really need the smartphone to ease your life to make your life happy so basically you just have to pay for the price of the monopoly because you really need that products or goods okay strategy of the commons means that the scarce resources are often access to everyone's so this can lead to a tragedy because everyone can do whatever they like to the resources so initially this was the case for cattle grazing on an english commons so basically fish fresh water hunted animals forests and many other open resources may all be subject to the tragedy so this occur because my use of the commons creates a negative externalities for other users of the commons so normally i only think about maximizing my own profit and ignore others best interest so the result of this is overuse of the resources so if you want to know the details of the tragedy of the commons you can have your reading or do your readings on the hardin 1968 this is a very common issues for the scarce resources which are open access let's look at the examples of tragedy of the commons for the case of fishing 
So H here or harvest could be the number of fish N is the efforts or the number of hours fishing or the number of boats fishing and basically these are actually the constraint where H the harvest and the effort is equals to zero or more than zero okay and we will have just a quadratic production function okay and your harvest should be on the y-axis and your efforts on n is just on the x-axis okay so this is just a simple static model so it says that when you have more effort definitely you will have more harvest but the case of tragedy of the commons is that your efforts is way too much and you will have a falling harvest so you will have the conditions of depletable resources where your harvest is actually equal to zero although your n or your effort is actually more so these are some of the assumption here so let's assume that the price is actually given the first units of fish can actually be sold at profit right and your total cost equals to cn so this small c your cost is equals to average cost and marginal cost okay and n is your effort and your profit function is equals to the price multiplied with the harvest or you call it revenue here minus your total cost okay we can compare the profit functions under the open access and economic optimum okay so under open access people will keep entering or we can say that the n will keep increasing until the profit is equals to zero so profit over n equals to zero you will get the value of p alpha minus p beta n minus c equals to zero so if you want to find the n you can rearrange it so you will get the value of p alpha minus c over p beta so this is the efforts or n under the open access so for economic optimum you have to do the first order condition which is d profits over dn equals to p alpha minus 2 beta p n minus c and you should equate it with zero so you rearrange it to find the n so your n equals to p alpha minus c over 2 beta p and you also may want to do the second order condition okay and d square profits over d n square you will get the value of minus 2 beta p and this is actually less than 0 so you have achieved the maximum profit condition okay now if you compare the result of open access which is this one with the economic optimum which is this one you can see that under economic optimum basically it is half of the amounts of effort in open access so we can say that if you have open access you are having too much effort compared to the economic optimum that's why you have the problems of tragedy of the commons because your effort of catching fish is more than what is needed or required if you want to draw a diagram for an open access so on your x-axis is the amounts of effort on your y-axis is the dollar so previously it was the harvest or the quantity collected so your total revenue from fishing as a function of effort equals to p which is just some number or the price multiplied with some quantity or the harvest okay your total cost is just a linear function so at this point which is an oa or the efforts in open access the firm will keep entering until your profit is equal to zero so increased level of effort is actually reducing the cash for others and you can see here that you will have a lower total revenue and lower harvest okay now where is the economic optimum point so you can find it where the difference between total revenue and total cost are at the maximum so the point is here okay which is at your n star so your n star should be half of the nox okay so for your information this is the concerns of resource economists 
especially when they talk about renewable resources that might get overused. So for economies, we recommend that you have to produce at NSTAR. But for the biologists or scientists, they will recommend us to produce at NE. Okay, so economists consider the cost of fishing. So we recommend to produce or to catch less fishing or fish compared to the scientists. And normally, economists will concern about achieving maximum economic yield. While for the scientists, they are very concerned to achieve maximum sustainable yield. Solving the tragedy. The first option is that we can assign property right. So we can create property right over the resources so that no one can do whatever they like. People can trade the right and people with the highest valuations of the resources will get to use it. So we can set the caps on the usage at the level that maximizes long run return from the resources. And the second option is that we can have or we can set up the institutional responses. So the institution can manage the commons in a sustainable way. So Elena Ostrom won the Nobel Prize in the economics for dealing with this tragedy of the commons. So for the details, you can read Dias et al. And you can also see this link on the tragedy of the commons. Multiple sources of market failure. There may be more than one source of market failure. For instance, we may have externalities and imperfect competition. If this is the case, correcting just one source of market failure will not necessarily improve the efficiency. So it may make things worse. So the lesson here is that each source of market failure require their own policy attention. We will look at this matter later. Imperfect information. This is another source of market failure. So if people don't know the effects of externality, such as water pollution, we cannot expect the free markets to provide an efficient solution. Information is often a public goods. And remember, public goods is very expensive. Private sector will undersupply it. So there is a role for the government to supply some types of information. For instance, the Australian government provide information on the pollution. So in the case of Malaysia, the government also provide the information on air pollution index. So you can just search in the internet because it is available. Do you think the government should intervene to address the market failure? Is it yes or is it no? We will discuss this question during the class time. Government intervention. So intervention may involve setting up new markets. For instance, market for pollution. For instance, you can set up how much is the price if let's say the firms wanted to pollute the environment. So you can also have direct provisions of public goods. For instance, if let's say the street lights are insufficient, so the government can provide the street lights to the public. And you can also have other activities such as the provision of information. As you know that the information is very expensive. So these provisions of information can help to reduce the transaction cost. And government can also impose tax or subsidies. Okay, so from an efficient point of view, the government's intervention is justified only when the expected net present value of benefits of intervention is actually bigger or larger than the expected net present value of the cost. Okay? For your information, the government is not perfect. It can also fail to provide an efficient allocation of resources. This occurs when the cost of intervention exceeds the benefits of intervention. So I have a question here. If let's say there is an increasing case of kidnapping kids when they are playing in the playgrounds, so the government decided to install or setting up CCTV to address this issue. Do you think that this action is justifiable if you think about the cost of installing this CCTV? So we will discuss this issue during the class time. 